Okay, this is a brief review of managing hypotension in a rapid response patient, and this talk ought to be subtitled, When Should I Use Norepinephrine on the Floor? I'm Paul Berg. I'm going to review some basic physiologic concept first, concepts first, and then we're going to talk through some of the more recent data on fluid resuscitation and pressors uh, in shock states. So these are the objectives. I'm just going to blow through these. So I first want to ask all of you, what determines blood pressure? Well, first, what is blood pressure, actually? Let's even take a step back and talk about that. So when we talk about a pressure within a vessel, we're really talking about the force exhibited against the wall. And that's exhibited against the wall of the aorta, but also with the major arteries, which is typically where we're checking blood pressure. And if you're trying to determine what uh, determines blood pressure, there's actually only a few major variables that are most important. Now, if you want to get into detailed physiology, I'd love to at some point, but really the simplest things are the following. The first is your blood flow or your cardiac output, and you can liken this to a garden hose. The more you turn the spigot up to turn up the flow of water, the pressure goes up as well. So clearly the amount of blood flowing through the aorta and the major arteries is a, a very significant determinant of blood pressure. The next thing is the amount of what we'll call stiffness or recoil or compliance or elastance, whatever you want to call it. It's the amount of stiffness and tone in the vascular wall. If it's stiffer, it'll have a higher pressure. If it's more compliant, it'll have a lower pressure. And the final major determinant is the area of uh, blood vessels available, the cross-sectional area in the distal arterioles. So this is what causes your blood pressure to be raised when you uh, vasoconstrict in these small arterial or beds. This is why uh, blood pressure is uh, preserved until late stages of hemorrhagic shock, for example, because you are uh, not only mobilizing blood on the venous side, but you're also vasoconstricting and limiting the arterial or beds in which the blood is flowing. So then why do patients get hypotensive? Simple hot pop quiz. Well, it's really one of two things. Uh, generally, it's loss of cardiac output or loss of systemic vascular resistance. And systemic vascular resistance, again, is related to the tone of the blood vessels as well as the cross-sectional area through which the blood is flowing. I know there's maybe a little bit advanced physiologic concepts. I don't know, but it's pretty simple. Uh, two variables that are determining this. So this ultimately gets at how we think about shock, and you have probably seen a table like this before. There are four major types of shock, and when we look at types of shock, we really look at those two determinants, cardiac output and SVR. Uh, I've put in this table the central venous pressure upon presentation as well for your reference, but again, when we're thinking about why do patients get hypotensive in shock states, well, it's either some combination of low cardiac output and or low systemic vascular tone. And in distributive shock, most which is often septic, uh, is you know usually a low SVR state. Some of the other states um, have compensatory increases in the SVR, so when you're hypovolemic or you go into cardiogenic shock, epinephrine and norepinephrine are released from your adrenal glands, and that causes your arterial tone to go up. So that tries to preserve blood pressure, but ultimately that will fail when cardiac output gets low enough. So let's just review what determines cardiac output. Cardiac output is really this simple equation, right? Stroke volume and heart rate. Heart rate is heart rate, right? You can manipulate this in some ways, but when we're trying to resuscitate patients and manage hypotensive patients on a ward, we're really thinking about how can I optimize stroke volume more often? And these are your major determinants of a stroke volume. You may remember the preload, which is the ventricular stretch and diastole, the contractility of the heart, which is the strength of contraction, and then the afterload, which are the various impediments to ventricular systole. This is somewhat simplified, but again, for our purposes of managing hypotensive patients in the ward, this is hopefully adequate. So when we think about preload, these are the factors that go into that. The volume status. What is the rate of venous return? What is the venous tone? So veins can constrict as well. And the more they squeeze, the more blood they bring back to the heart. Is there obstruction to return? So when we think about obstructive forms of shock, things like pneumothorax, tamponade, these start to restrict the amount of blood that's actually able to make it back into the, uh, the thorax or into the heart, and that ultimately decreases preload as well. Contractility, we're just going to say, is an inherent property to the myocardium, and when we're managing hypotensive patients on a ward, we're not typically doing that. And then afterload is any impediment to ventricular systole. We think about this often in terms of the systemic vascular resistance, but other things also affect it, like arterial stiffness, obstruction of flow. So if patients have a bad, um, a bad aortic valve or they have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, now just called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, these things obstruct blood flow and increase afterload as well. So we're going to focus on one part of stroke volume manipulation, and that's um, going to be the preload. So when you think about how does IV fluid resuscitation help cardiac output, it's through preload. So when you're hanging a bag of lactator ringers and trying to increase uh, the patient's blood pressure, what you're really trying to do in that situation is improve cardiac output. And the thing you're most directly manipulating is the stroke volume, or so you hope. You're trying to increase the amount of ventricular stretch and diastole with a fluid bolus so that the stroke volume will then go up and cardiac output will follow.
Now, as we can see, the different types of shock have different responsiveness to fluid. So clearly, hypovolemic and distributive are going to be very fluid responsive. In fact, that's the major problem in hypovolemic patients, right? So if you can uh, restore the amount of circulating volume, the venous pressure is low to begin with, and if you can restore that volume, the pressure will go up and cardiac output will follow. Distributive shock is a little bit different. It's often a loss of venous tone. So the venous uh, blood vessels lose their ability to constrict, so you need more volume to increase the cardiac output. These vessels are leakier, they're uh, more pliable, the veins don't squeeze as much back to the heart, so that's why you add fluid to the tank to improve cardiac output. But as you move down the table here, these things become less and less fluid responsive. So obstructive shock can somewhat be counterbalanced by uh, taking up the venous pressure. You can counter, counteract some of the obstructive forms of shock like pneumothorax, autopeeping, tamponade by taking patients up with fluid, but only up to a point. And then cardiogenic shock is the least amenable to uh, uh, volume resuscitation because uh, you really don't have any ability to increase venous tone or venous pressure anymore. It's already sort of maximal in many patients. So when we think about how fluid boluses improves, uh, improves blood pressure, again, we're looking at does it improve stroke volume? And these are Frank Starling curves. If you're not familiar with them, that's okay, but just recognize that this orange line here is a stroke volume or cardiac output, and this blue line is your venous return, and the green line is your fluid bolus. So when you're giving a fluid bolus, you're trying to increase venous pressure and move this venous return curve in a way that is going to substantially boost your stroke volume. What we see on uh, the not volume responsive patient is they're actually already on a pretty flat part of their stroke volume curve, and you're not going to be able to get much more bang for your buck when you give them a fluid bolus. So this is what we're thinking about when we're thinking about fluid responsiveness. Now, this is very difficult often in the ward patient to determine where they are in these curves, but this is the whole rationale for giving a fluid bolus. So when will a fluid bolus not improve blood pressure? Well, one is when you have really decompensated left ventricular failure. And here's an example of that. This is an echo, and I'll orient you. This is left atrium, left ventricle, and right ventricle. And in this situation, the left ventricle is unable to stretch. Further, it's unable to empty. So when you start to fluid load this patient, there's nowhere for it to go except for back into the lungs. This left ventricle, uh, left ventricle is not going to be able to accommodate much more volume because it can't squeeze and it's already pretty stretched out. Similarly, this happens in decompensated RV failure or pulmonary hypertension. And in this situation, it's the RV that gets overstretched. And what can happen is that the RV gets so overstretched that it will actually push into the LV. So we see a patient here with, a, this is the right atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. This left ventricle is already hypertrophied, uh, perhaps for some other reason. And this right ventricle, though, is really overloaded. So it's already... Um, restricting the filling of the left ventricle, and the more fluids I try to pour into this heart, I'm actually just going to further overload my RV, and it's going to worsen my LV function. So it's these decompensated LV and RV failure patients that are not going to be fluid responsive. So again, pop quiz. Arrange these shock states from most to least fluid responsive. Well, hopefully you recognize that the hypovolemic patient is the most responsive to fluid, the distributive shock patient is a close second, and as you start to move towards obstructive and cardiogenic forms of shock, they become less and less fluid responsive. So that leads into the next part of this talk, which is when should I use norepinephrine on the floor? Well, if you're thinking about when or not, when not, to, when or when not to use norepinephrine, uh, you know, I would say that the cardiogenic shock patients are the patients I'm most likely to start norepinephrine, and the hypovolemic patients are the least likely, right? Here, I want to give volume and not give pressors. Cardiogenic shock, I'm probably not giving volume, and I'm just going to be giving pressors. So let's talk about some specific disease states. The most common pro problem, I think, on wards is what, as to why patients become hypotensive in the hospital is sepsis. So here's a contemporary understanding of early fluid resuscitation in sepsis. Again, just to review the physiology, sepsis could be a low to high cardiac output state. It depends on the patient's comorbidities. But venous tone is almost uniformly low, and the venous pressure will be low as well. Now, their volume status might have started out okay, but once this venous tone is lost, the veins dilate, then you start to lose pressure in the veins. And that's why fluid resuscitation is often the cornerstone of managing hypotensive se sepsis patients because it's the easiest thing to do, but also can restore venous uh, pressure, which can then can restore cardiac output. Things like vasopressors and dibutamine are typically reserved for ICU situations, although, again, we're going to talk about when you might want to use vasopressors on a floor. So in terms of resuscitating sepsis and early fluid resuscitation of sepsis, what do the most recent guidelines say? Well, the 2016-2017 surviving sepsis guidelines say um, from when patients have sepsis-induced hypoperfusion, at least 30 mLs per kgs of IV crystallite should be given within three hours. And that's a strong recommendation, but it's on weak evidence. 
and the volume of that bolus is based on early goal-directed therapy trials and other observational data. So they try to give us a best size or one size fits all approach. So in general, about 30 mLs per kg is a good amount of fluid bolus someone with when they have sepsis-induced hypoperfusion. Now who's at risk for under-resuscitation? Patients like these, elderly patients, heart failure patients, and stained renal disease patients, and obese patients, we tend to under-resuscitate these patients. Now, sometimes these patients are already overloaded, um, but sometimes they're not. So uh, that's really a difficult decision to make at the bedside, but recognize these are the patients that we end up being a little too soft in our fluids often when they have sepsis. Now, again, you want to be pretty clear that they have sepsis before you're just loading them with fluids, but uh, recognize these are the patients that are at highest risk for being under-resuscitated. So those guidelines came out before some of the really con uh, interesting contemporary data about sepsis bundles. And what do we know for mandatory sepsis bundles? So for example, in the state of New York, there's been a uh, legislation that has required a sepsis bundle. And these bundles appear to reduce mortality from sepsis. There are a lot of confounders here. But the variable that's most important actually is antibiotic timing. That's the most important variable to um, hosp in hospital mortality. When they try to isolate out the intravenous fluid boluses, there's actually no difference in mortality based on the timeliness of fluid resuscitation. So while we've had hammered on our heads from the surviving sepsis guidelines over the last number of years that we should uh, provide early fluid resuscitation in sepsis, it would, uh, this data would suggest that the timing of that fluid bolus is not of critical importance. What do we know from observational studies of ICU patients? Well, we know that in general, in ICU patients, a cumulative fluid balance is consistently linked to greater risk of death. Now, these are observational studies of critically ill patients. Not all of them are septic, but the vast majority are. And as you can see, the survivors of critical illness have much lower cumulative fluid balance than those that are non-survivors. Now, this is all observational, so you're not sure if they got more fluids because they were sicker, um, but the reality is that fluid overloading patients in sepsis is probably a bad idea as well. So what's the sweet spot? Well, I'm not really sure, but here is a nice contemporary approach. I think this is probably the best approach on wards with rapid response patients based on the latest literature. And this comes from the Andromeda shock uh, study, uh, which basically looked at lactate clearance versus peripheral perfusion guided resuscitation of sepsis. But we can extrapolate some things from here. As you can see, the peripheral perfusion guided, uh, guided therapy was just as good, if not better, than the lactate. This ended up being a non-significant p-value, but it got pretty darn close. So we can you know, depending on how you want to interpret this, you might start to say, well, peripheral perfusion is a good way to assess patients. And here's what they did in this study. They assessed capillary refill time and or lactate upon identification of the septic patient. And this is what I think we should do on wards, right? If we, if we find the capillary refill time is greater than three seconds in the nail beds of the fingers, and the patient is, in particular, if they have end organ dysfunction, you should begin with IV fluid bolusine with 500 ml aliquots at the bedside. And you should continue to reassess this capillary refill time every 30 minutes after each 500 ml bolus. This is the way they did it in the study and this had good outcomes, particularly when they compared it to lactate-guided uh, lactate resuscitation strategies as well. So I think this is probably the safest, best way to fluid resuscitate hypotensive septic patients on a ward. Then the question is, should we start norepinephrine early, like on the wards? And uh, this was a recent randomized trial, probably some pilot data, but you know, a very good study. And they looked at norepinephrine in early septic shock. And in early uh, septic shock, nor norepinephrine improved shock reversal earlier, which makes sense, right? Including better maps, better urine output, better lactate clearance early in the course of sepsis. Now the caveat here is that all patients in this study received the 30 ml per kg bolus on average. So the patients were fluid resuscitated first. Um, but when they were not responsive to fluid resuscitation, that norepinephrine actually looked to be safe. In fact, there were no major safety problems were seen in the nor early norepinephrine group. And in fact, the early norepinephrine group was associated with fewer arrhythmias, which I would bet are uh, less uh, instances of AFib due to atrial stretch. So I, this would suggest, this is early data, but there is some early emerging data that early norepinephrine is at least safe and uh, should complement your fluid resuscitation what do we know about uh, norepinephrine and other forms of shock? Well, we know that uh, some late uh, recent literature has shown that norepinephrine is at least as efficacious and probably safer than using epi in these situations, and it's clearly safer than dopamine. So if somebody is uh, suddenly hypotensive on the wards and you think it's cardiogenic, norepinephrine is probably the safest agent to use uh, for minimizing arrhythmias and uh, reversing shock. 
Hemorrhagic shock, we don't have good clinical data, at least in uh, animal models, though. Norepinephrine appears to be safe. It does not appear to starve the, uh, the, the intestines of blood flow and other concerns that we often have when patients are hemorrhaging. That said, that said, blood and volume resuscitation have, have been and will remain cornerstones in managing hemorrhagic shock. But in a pinch, in a very hypotensive patient in whom you're giving volume, you could potentially temporize them with norepinephrine. May be safe, probably safe. As for obstructive shock, I don't think we'll ever have that data. Uh, but again, norepinephrine can temporize, and, uh, but obviously relieving the obstruction is most important. So if they have a pneumothorax, you got to decompress it. If they have tamponade, you got to relieve it. Fortunately, this is the most uncommon form of shock to identify in a ward patient. Um, so it's probably uh, not something you're going to encounter frequently. Further, fluid resuscitation, again, will often overcome some of that obstruction. Uh, so that, that may be uh, in part helpful. So what are the takeaway points? What is our contemporary understanding of all of this? I would say that in hypotensive patients, the response to IV fluid depends on the underlying cause of shock. Clearly, that's always been the case. But we're starting to recognize now that fluid overload is, a, is potentially a bad thing. There are some nice ways uh, to predict fluid responsiveness, and, but all these good predictors of fluid responsiveness require an arterial line and or an echo probe. So it's very difficult in a ward patient to identify who's going to respond to fluids with bedside assessment. Thus, on the floor, I think a safe approach is to first assess the hypotensive patient for signs of endorgan dysfunction or endorgan hypoperfusion. So mental status, respiratory distress, and modeling and or capillary refill time on exam. If you find these things on exam, I would say it's probably safe and probably best to give them an empiric bolus of 500 ml of IV crystalloid and then reassess endorgan response within 15 to 30 minutes. Don't keep loading them indiscriminately, 500 ml aliquots. And I would say if you're really worried about the patient or you're waiting for an IC bed, starting norepinephrine is not inherently harmful. And it's probably better than continuing to fluid load someone indiscriminately, particularly once you start to approach this 1,500 to 2,000 ml of fluid loading, which is sort of a good starting dose, a good 30 ml per kg for most people is somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and if they're still hypotensive despite that, then starting the norepinephrine early is at least probably safe and probably not harmful. All right, thanks. Hopefully that was helpful.